Hi, welcome to Head Start, the podcast for race directors and the business of putting on races. Have you ever thought about timing your races yourself? Building your own RFID timing system? Perhaps even building a small race timing business on the side as a way to diversify your income? Well, doing your own race timing is certainly not for everyone. For most race directors, managing their own race timing is the last thing they need on race day. Nevertheless, DIY race timing is exactly the route many race directors choose to go down, either to save money, try their hands at building a race timing side business, or simply for the enjoyment of building their own RFID timing system. Today, I'll be talking to Brian Agee of AG Race Timing, a man very well known among DIY race timing enthusiasts, not only for his very popular race timing software, but also for his willingness to share with others everything he's learned building and operating DIY race timing systems. Over the next hour or so, we'll be touching on a few things with Brian, from choosing the right components for your race timing system, to bringing everything together, setting up your system correctly, and avoiding some common race day pitfalls. So stick with us for a very interesting discussion. Before we go into all that though, I want to give a quick shout out to our podcast sponsor, Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up, the leading all-in-one technology solution for endurance and fundraising events. More than 22,000 in-person, virtual and hybrid events use Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up's free and integrated solution to save time, grow their events and raise more. And it's through the support of our friends at Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up that we can bring you great free content like today's podcast. So if you want to check out the many things that Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up can do for your event, from streamlined online registration and free email marketing to having your own super slick race website, make sure to visit runsignup.com. One last thing, if you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite player. And if you really, really enjoy this podcast, please leave us a review. It would mean a great deal to us. Okay, let's get into this amazing episode. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Uh, glad to be here. Thanks a lot for coming on. You are the owner of uh, AG Race Timing, which is a race timing software company. But I should say for the benefit of today's episode, it's a lot more than that. And um, in fact, one of the main reasons why I uh, sought your expertise for today's podcast is because um, through AG Race Timing, you've also been helping lots of people build and learn how to operate um, race timing systems. Sure. So tell us a little bit about AG Race Timing and what you guys do there and your experience with uh, building uh, RFID timing systems. Yeah, that, that was a good setup because originally uh, I, my plan was just to uh, build a race timing software and that's it. And uh, for my own personal use, uh, I, I probably have a similar story to a lot of people that are looking to build their own system where my first race I ever directed I was stuck with this decision of, um, and it was for an organization that was very well known. There's a lot of schools that have a, it's called the FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And so every school in my area had one. And so I knew that uh, at Arkansas State University, where um, we were trying to start up an FCA program, that we could get a lot of support in the community and that this race could be large. But we're also a brand new organization. And me, me and a couple of girls in the volleyball team are trying to put together uh, this club. Of course, we have no money. And so it's like, we're stuck with this decision of, what if we have 500 people show up? we need to hire a chip timer or what if we only have 50 and we're in the hole? And so that was the, t- the tough decision. And so the natural progression and natural journey, I feel like people go through is they, they look at, okay, do I time it myself? Uh, if you're familiar with the card system or popsicles or whatever, that's a, that's not fun for anybody. <laughs> it's, it's basically free, but it's not fun and results take forever. Um, and the other option of course was hiring a chip timer. And then basically I feel like, you know, what if I work for two months and worst case scenario, I go in the hole. The next worst case scenario is I work for two months and someone else gets you know all the money from it you know and so and so I try to find surely there's some middle of the road option here surely I can download some free Excel based program or uh, maybe there's somebody because I mean races are all over the world and races have been around forever so surely there's some free program that makes race timing easy and uh, I downloaded some of the programs that and they, hey they're good programs but you know race director run score they've timed all kinds of big events good programs I've met you know Roger and Alan good guys but it's one of those things that. They, they develop software for large events. You know, they have to be able to handle large events. And so uh, the vast majority of all races around the world are small to medium-sized road races and stuff. And so uh, I just was surprised there was no, nothing that was easy. 
nothing didn't have yearly fees and all that stuff. So that's that's kind of when a seed was planted in my mind to, to maybe do something about this someday. And that's that's kind of what I tried to do. So I, I used the system for a few years. Worked great. Never had intentions of releasing out to the public. Uh, ended up getting married, having twins. And of course, life stops. You know, so I kind of stopped race timing for a while. Um, and then I, I kept getting emails and calls from race directors in the area saying, hey, man, you know, <laughs> the timer is killing us. And so uh, that's when I decided, you know what, I'm going to try to release this out to the wild. And that that involved a dramatic rewrite, you know, because uh, the database was not, you know, it's, it's a SQL Server database, SQL Express, and it takes an hour to install and set up. So I, it took a while to to get it all going. But when I released it, the next step was people said, "Hey, can you make it work with RFID hardware?" And so that's that's the journey. And then I'm sure that's what we'll talk about today is, um, yeah, how to get started finding equipment, what works, what doesn't work. There's a lot of things that you you may think about and say, "Oh, well, let's try wristbands, let's try this or that." And uh, you'll discover why no one's using those because some of that stuff looks good on paper, but just doesn't perform well. Exactly. And as you said, today we're going to be talking about both how to build an RFID timing system, what hardware you're going to need, how you're going to put it all together, how it all works, how it comes together, but also very crucially, which is something that I find also in terms of um, online content out there is missing a little bit. Also, how to actually use that system in real life to time a race, which is really important. But before we go into all that, I think it's really important, and you sort of highlighted it a little bit in your story about how you went into producing the software and then doing what you do through, through AG Race Timing, to spend a minute to discuss, like, first of all, these timing systems we're going to be we're going to be going through, um, you know, like the build procedure for sort of what do we mean when we say, you know, these systems are DIY and what kinds of people are these systems primarily suitable for? Some people reach out to me and they say, Hey, I'm trying to build a system and I've got this reader, but they're not sure what to do after that. So it's like, there's a, there's a, there's a, a gap here that they fail to see. Um, whereas you can't just buy equipment and, and hook it all together and then plug it into your computer. You've got to have software that allows the data that, you know, you're going to get a flood of data when a tag comes across. First of all, you have to even be able to tell the reader, hey, start listening. And so you can't just buy a reader, hook it up to your laptop, turn it on, and it just magically produces results. you got to have software that does something with this flood of data. So so when I, I guess uh, when I hear DIY, there's, there's a certain component of it that's not really DIY, unless you're a software developer or great with data manipulation. Um, there may be... You know, like I think most every reader has like a little uh, app you can just kind of test the reader out with. And I've seen some people do some pretty creative things with taking the data that spits out from that and then like, you know, having some Excel program that reads it. But th- those 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 people, people are few and far between. Um, so true DIY, if you're doing everything yourself, means software and everything. So uh, we're going to. So I like to kind of qualify your average person as more looking for an open system, not a DIY system. Right. Um, and so an open system basically is, you know, no really fees. You're looking for, you know, you're not locked into proprietary tags or anything else. And so that's kind of, I guess, why I would draw a little line between open versus DIY. But yeah, that's, that's hope that answers that question. But. Right. Right. Yeah. And and I suppose open, the the best comparison for people to understand the kind of system we're talking about is to sort of consider it alongside the branded timing systems that most people mm-hmm. would be familiar with, right? The the MyLabs, the ChronoTracks, the IPCO, all of those, all of those systems, which sort of like mm-hmm. come in a box. They, uh, you know, they have their their pros and cons, I guess. So, so how does the system that we're going to be talking about today, which you put together, compare? With, which, as you said, is an open system compared to some of those systems that you can buy off the shelf from one of the RFID timing system manufacturers? In the very beginning of my journey, you know, first thing I did was, okay, let me just see what all equipment's out there. And, and it's, it, it's a fortunate thing. It's an unfortunate thing that there's so many options, right? So it's, it's good that there's a lot of options, but it's also bad because some of the stuff you want to avoid really. Um, and it's not obvious when you first started, like, okay, this reader uh, turns out like anyone that really knows about timing knows avoid that reader, right? I mean, so it's, so it's good there's a lot of options, but when it comes to the the pros, I guess, of the package system is these guys are going to develop a good product because just like me, they don't want to be hammered with tech support. They don't want their name brand not looking good because the system's not performing well. So the pros of buying a package system is that, you know, they've done all the research. They're going to make sure that like you follow in line with what you're supposed to do. Um, and so whereas an open system, you, you, you know, now, of course, uh, taking a step back, you know, if, if you buy 
uh, software that allows everything to work together, the software provider is going to say, hey, you need to use this hardware. Uh, you need to kind of follow these rules because, again, they don't want the tech support. They don't want their name brand not looking good. And so the, the the pros, I guess, of a DIY system, of course, I mentioned before, is the no yearly fees, the not stuck into proprietary hardware, no price gouging on the things you do buy from them. Yeah, you because know, a lot of systems out there, that's their bread and butter is, is and I've talked to a couple, they all agree, that, like, uh, there's not a whole lot of people in the world that want to be race timers. And so whenever you do get a customer, a lot of these systems, you know, they've got infrastructure, tech support, development, marketing, executives, everyone they got to pay. And so usually what happens, you buy a system and, and there's some catch in there, some hook. They've got to make money perpetually. So uh, the benefit of the open system is that let's say you time a race once every three years. Or you're not paying that extra year, you know, you're not paying for a system you're not using after a couple of years. And so the other benefit, I guess, with with open system is that UHF just works. UHF RFID works well. You do have to kind of know the rules of using UHF RFID. And some of those rules I learned, again, it looked good on paper, like, oh, I'll try this. And it turns out it didn't work well. But in, in general, UHF works really well. And I guess that's the main benefits. I mean, the, the, the cons of the open system, if you're designing yourself, like I said before, is all the options. I mean, you could really twist yourself in a pretzel trying to figure out what type of antenna should I use. I mean, there's, you know, circular, linear, all these other options. And so, uh, so that's kind of the pros and cons. And again, a software company, if you, if it's, I know a, a run sign up is, you know, doing race day scoring and I, I figure that they haven't, you know, said it public or whatever. I figure eventually it may go to, you know, Hey, you can plug in your own hardware from buy wherever you want. Uh, I know that, what is it? A web score. They have it to where it's pretty much an open system. Yeah. You know, I think they charge it maybe per finisher or something like that. I'm not sure, but yeah, you know, all these systems you have to look at what what hardware they work with and kind of follow the rules. But yeah, hope that hope that takes care of that part. Yeah, and also I think part of the branded system you mentioned there, but but um, we didn't sort of like close the loop on that. The branded system because they need, as you said, there's probably sometimes a sort of um, structure where even after having bought the system, you know, the company needs to make revenue from the systems. One of the way in which this is done is by those systems, the off-the-shelf, you know, like the branded systems, working with specific tags that those companies provide to you. So, for instance, then you, you don't perhaps get some of the benefits of just going out in the open market and buying any kind of tag that would work with a DIY system that might not work with a branded system. Is that right? Yeah, they, they password protect the tags, which means that, well, I guess I mean I, I guess I don't want to define too too much how those other systems work because I don't see the internals, but but yeah, you can't buy uh, tags just from anywhere. Uh, and some of the systems you can't even let's say that you and I own the same system, same company, and everything. I couldn't use your reader. Let's say you live down the street from me. Yeah, I couldn't use your reader. It's it's very very locked down. Mm. There's a lot of pushback on that, and that's why whenever I first released this, I didn't really have a lot of marketing around it. I just, and in fact, I still don't have a lot. It, it, people come to me um, simply because they're Google searching. How do I, you know, do, do yourself system? Um, so I think there's a lot of demand out there for something that's open source or open hardware. And I've, again, I've talked to a couple of these companies. They, they all agree that like the, the, vast, the vast majority of their customer base is your mom and pop weekend warrior, small to medium sized races. So that's why I feel like that a lot of timers, if they, if they never really time a race that's over 5,000 participants, they probably should go with an open system. Um, and, and yeah, that's the other thing is those box systems. If you look at their websites, a lot of them are like advertising, hey, we're the most precise or we time the biggest races in the world. But for every one big race, you're going to have probably 100 or more small races. Uh, and, and, and UHF RFID is kind of a silly argument to like for one system to promote itself over another for being a, you know, the more accurate one. Because by nature, UHF RFID is not a laser precise finish link you know, photo system. Right. Okay. So moving on to the um, nitty gritty of... Um building such a system. Can you walk us through sort of like the major components that um, are required by such a system and how they sort of come together, how they how they work together? Oh, yeah. So obviously the, the main component is the reader. So we'll start there. Uh, so the reader, it's got no moving components, just a, just a reader there. And it's got, uh, usually it comes in a couple of different configurations. Uh, if you see this online, it'll say two port, for example, FX7400, two port FX7500, whatever, uh, or, you know, two port, a pins reader, whatever. So the two ports means you can hook up to two antennas to it. Uh, and then a four port reader obviously means up to four antennas, eight port reader up to eight. Uh, what's interesting, and I'll, I'll take a little sidetrack here, is some people make an argument that the less antennas are better. Uh, we can dig into that later, but that the number of ports really indicates the number of antennas you can hook, hook up to it. Uh, so that's, that's the main component is the reader. The reader is going to connect to your laptop. 
Now, other systems, of course, can do Bluetooth connections, whatever else. Uh, and you can do this even with open, but your standard setup is going to be a reader that's hooked up to your laptop with an Ethernet cord. And so Ethernet cord, you probably have those laying around your house. Um, so it doesn't have to be any special Ethernet cord, just a standard Ethernet cable. And so the reader hooks up to the laptop with Ethernet. Now, the reader is just the brains. It doesn't have ears or a mouth to try to, to echo out, hey, what tags are out there? So you have to have antennas that hook up to their reader. Again, with the uh, two port, four port or whatever, a lot of people uh, would use either mad antenna or panel antennas. Uh, my recommendation is kind of get the best of both worlds. There's a company in, in China, I think, called Feeba. It's the only Chinese product I recommend, but it's uh, they make a really good quality mad antenna that's a very good value. In fact, one of their panel or mad antennas is equal to the price or maybe less of four panel antennas. Um, and so what I actually recommend is get one of those mats four meters wide and then get one or two panels up on the side. That way you're reading from below and from the sides. And for you to go through my finish line, even in a tight group, it's really hard to miss you. So you got the reader, you got the Ethernet cord. Obviously, you got to have a laptop. Most people already have that. That's that does the work with the you know the software and everything. I uh, got the antennas, and I guess the final component is the uh, the tags. And so that's that's the core equipment: laptop, reader, connects. You know, the reader connects to the laptop with the Ethernet cord. The uh, antennas out there, whether it be mad antenna or panels, are going to have, well, one of the components, I guess, is the cables that connect the, the uh, antenna to the reader. Let me go through it one last time. Reader, Ethernet cord, laptop, antennas, antenna cables, and tags. That's your core components. Perfect. And you mentioned there, uh, for people who may not be uh, super familiar with the distinction, you mentioned mat antennas that people would be, even if they don't know much about timing systems, they would be familiar with if they've done big races where you actually have, you know, like you go over the finish line and there's a kind of like long mat. So that's actually an antenna reading tags as you go over it, both at the start and the finish line versus panel antennas, which are more like they don't obstruct. There's nothing on the road. There's just on the side or up top or somewhere, right? On the um on the on the finish arch or something. And they just record crosses, like they just record times without actually having to uh, be laid down on the floor. So we're just for people who might be interested in knowing this, where would I uh, best use one over the other? Yeah, that's a great question because if let's say that you're in a uh, you're a person that wants to time inline roller skating races. Well, would you want those people? And those guys are moving. I've been to a couple of the races. Pretty amazing to watch watch those. But those guys are flying, and those inline skaters do not want to roll over a mat. And so that's a good case where you're going to have some kind of arch structure that brings the antenna cable over to the side, and maybe you want to use panels uh, on each side. Um, cycling races the same way. I mean, cycle a bicycle going over a mat is not a big deal, but uh, in my opinion, I think the panel antennas would be better. So. Obviously, there's a million types of races out there. Just think it, you know, think that through. Like, okay, is it a problem for someone speeding through my finish line? Will a mat get in the way? Uh, and even with panel antennas, if you don't have some kind of arch structure, uh, or if if you're timing in the dirt or sand, of course, you can bury the cables there. But keep in mind that with panel antennas, you uh, if it's on the road, you're gonna have rubber mats covering the cables so people don't trip on them. A lot of here's the thing: for years, I used just panel antennas. Great read rates, never had any issues, even with chip starts with, you know, thousands of people flowing through. And so now with those, by the way, you need to understand like, okay, uh, with panel antennas, you want to keep the, the starting line as narrow as possible so that, you know, that way you get people passing as close to the antenna as possible, but you know, not so narrow, it's uncomfortable for the runners. So the point is panel antennas in most cases can do the job, no matter what type of event you're timing. A lot of people do, do like the convenience of the mat because it simply unfolds and you're done. And so here's the thing. Imagine yourself. If you're a race timer, you know what I'm talking about. You show up before the sun gets up. You're there before anybody gets there because, you know, often I like to have my finish line totally set up before anybody's there to register or anything. That way you're, you kind of got to, you know, your brain can think about one thing at a time. You know, think about my finish line set up, getting all the timing stuff ready. Now let me focus on registration. After registration's over, okay, now let me focus on the start and so on. And so the mad antenna is really convenient. You could just unfold it. Uh, it could be cold. It could be dark. It's real easy. You're not having to hook a, a panel antenna up to like a tripod or set up a truss in the dark or whatever. You just unfold it, connect to your reader and you're done. But you know, there's some drawbacks to uh, the mat. Uh, I, I don't think it performs as well as the panels, but that's why I said before, uh, I like to use a mat plus a couple of antennas. That way I only set up one panel antenna on one side of the finish line. On the other side of the finish line, I've got my mat kind of TP'd up to where it reads sideways. In most cases, I think the panels are, are, your, are your best bet if you're just getting started and you want to play the system. 
And in terms of um, the tags that you mentioned there, is a system like this going to be able to accommodate both passive tags and active tags and basically any kind of RFID tag? A UHF RFID tag, yeah. So you can't buy like a, uh, what is it, NFC or whatever else. And you know, UHF readers read UHF tags. So, uh, but yes, active and passive, no problems. To be honest, I've never been to a race and I've ran races uh, all over the world and, and uh, hundreds of races since since I started running. And I don't know if I've ever been to a race that you use passive tags. Now, there are, there are needs for them. Uh, but again, it's just one of those niche races where where active is really the better, you know, maybe mud runs or something where the tag could be covered. But yes, it, it'll read both, but it, it's it's highly unlikely that your average timer is ever going to need to buy a passive tag or sorry, active tags. Right. So most races, they use passive tags. The the ones that people would be familiar with, you know, like the little foamy stuff you, you stick at the back of the bib, right? Yeah, the dog bones. Um, and that's even debatable whether or not the foam is necessary. And it's even debatable whether or not the foam is patented. So yeah, you, most timers just uh, you know, avoid worrying about any patent concerns uh, until all that's worked out. I'm not going to get into what all is going on now in the industry, but uh, the read rates, again, it's debatable, but I've, I've got a lot of customers that don't use the foam and just slap a, a dog bone at the back of the bib and they get great results. Right. So in terms of the of an entry level system, right? So I guess you have the, the main choice would be do I do I build a two port system that can support two antennas or do I build a four port system which supports four antennas which obviously is going to be more expensive or do I even go beyond that? And the question is what is sort of like the price difference between a two port and a four port? Which one would you recommend as a first time buy? And what kind of limitations would building one over the other have? So it's an interesting question because when you, if you're just if you're like me, my objective was to say how cheap can I go and still get great results, right? I mean, how cheap can I go and uh, still reliably get 100 percent to where you know again even my, my timing guys and I we time about 70 maybe more. Uh, obviously, last year was low, uh, but we time 70 plus races a year. And so I don't want to get a system in that again makes my timing system or timing services side of the business look bad, but you know, just for playing with UHF, RFID, you know, trying to learn how it all works and and having a system that can handle most every race, a two-port reader is is fine. Uh, now, once you get a probably, let's say for a 5K, probably over 300 people, that then you start thinking, okay, you know what, maybe go and get a four-port reader. Um, and it's really, I guess the way to think about it is not how many people, it's how busy is your finish line. Mm-hmm. So if you were timing a one-mile race, I'd say, okay, hey, maybe 100 people, you know, is where you start wanting to get more antennas. But um, so that's, I guess there's no hard lines on this. Just think about how busy is my finish line. And if I've got multiple occurrences of, uh, two or more people crossing at the same time, and let's say that's very frequent for my race, then the more intent is the better. Cause let's say you and I cross at the exact same time. And of course, you know, you could set a, a tag on each side of your body, or, or if you're using a bib tag or whatever, it, it, it depends on your antenna placement, but it's very possible if you've got, let's say only side panel antennas and you and I cross at the same time and, Let's say that you tell the participants, oh, just put the tag anywhere on your body, uh, you know, maybe on the side of the shorts, you can pin it to the side of the shorts or slide down your shoelace. Well, then it's highly likely that as we go through the finish line, maybe your body's blocking my tag for that short window that we crossed by the antennas. And so that's kind of a long answer, but the, the, the basic principle is if you're looking at, if you can find like a $50 reader on eBay for this two ports, well, then buy that, test it out, see if it works for you just to get comfortable with the system. And then you also have a backup reader if you decide to upgrade your readers later. And that, that two port reader you can use like as a turnaround point on the marathon or something, you know. And so it's not a bad idea to get that. Your average person, though, is probably best starting with a four port reader, mm-hmm. four antennas. Uh, it, there's a discussion in my users group uh, years ago where people are saying, hey, if I had this to do again, would you start with a four port or the eight port? Everybody unanimous said, go with the biggest reader you can because when word gets out, you've got a timing system, your business will grow. I mean, it's. I tell people that usually when I time a race, I come home with two. The one I just time wants me back next year. And then while I time me, someone says, oh, I'm thinking about, or we have this race, you know, and they hired me uh, or want to talk to me about doing their race. And so you should find that every year, your number of races almost double. And so uh, if you start off with a two-port reader, you'd be upgrading pretty quick. Right. And uh, in terms of the cost, what's the relative cost of, let's say, you know, building yeah. a two-port system versus a four-port system or even an eight-port to begin with? Sure. 
So yeah, the two port reader. Let's let's just go with full price, full MSRP. Top, you know, your top you're gonna pay. Just uh, again, a couple of reasons. Number one, uh, a lot of people want to get that you know brand new versus a used, and what if it doesn't work? But the other thing is with the chip shortage going on in the world right now, you can't hardly find used readers. Um, and so let's just go with brand new. I don't have the price right for me. It was probably about eight hundred dollars for a two port reader, uh, something like the Appinge or the Motorola's or Zebras. Um, and then for the four port model. Uh, from us, because I think we price it right at MSRP to make sure we never take a loss, but it's, you know, like 1150, I think is what we charge for a, two, a four port model. Mm -hmm. uh, and then your eight port model is uh, 1650, $1,700. So it's, the other part of it is that for $500 more, you get twice the ports. So that's a lot of people say, Hey, I'll just go ahead and pay the extra 500 and get an eight port reader versus a four. Um, the big benefit with the eight versus four is that let's say you want to use a mad antenna. The, the, the uh, most mat antennas are going to, if they got four antennas built into the mat, that takes that four of your ports. And so if you have a four port reader and you have a mat and you want to put a, a side panel too, that means you got to unhook one of your mat cables and, and put the side panel up. So the more ports you have, the more options you have is, is, is what it is. Yeah. You'll see some finish lines where they got two rows of mats. You could definitely go with two four port readers, one for each mat, um, or you can do an eight port reader and control all of them. Again, the pros and cons with both, uh, we can get into that if you want, but yeah, you know, on how readers work and how they cycle and where you may find more ports is not good in some situations, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's the price point is roughly $1,700 for the eight port, 1200 roughly for the uh, four port, and then maybe 800 for the two port. And in terms of sort of, just to give people an idea of what the total cost for a system would be, you know, I mean, including the reader, the, the antennas, cables. Uh, software, like ballpark, what kind of figure are we talking about? So if somebody ever releases free software, uh, that would be amazing. Now, if it's not, a lot of people can, can make uh, software that's half patched together and, and whatever. I'm, I'm talking about software that works really well, it's clean and whatever. That would be amazing. And in fact, I've always told like run sign up that it's like, man, if, if, if somebody releases software that's amazing and easy and does everything people need, then I'll step aside. So, you know, like I've got a good job. I, I, I write police software for a living. I'm a practitioner. So like uh, I did this because I saw a huge hole in the market. So let's just, we have to add the cost of software in. I don't, we have to go with base of mind because I don't know if any of the software out there that's open hardware. So I charge $900 a one-time fee for the software. Uh, even if you add on other timing systems or other timing crews, there's no extra cost. But so that's $900 for the software. Um, and then the reader, like we said before, let's imagine you go at the top of the line reader, the, the FX 9,600. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that's, that's the only eight port model that I'm aware of. There are some Chinese brands that are eight ports, but, uh, I haven't been able to interface with any of the Chinese readers. Uh, the, the documentation is not the, not the best. Um, and so that's going to be $1,700. And then you've got the, uh, antennas again, the mat antenna from Feebot is roughly 600 for the four meter mat. Uh, or you can go with panel antennas, let's say four, cause for most races, four antennas is all you're ever going to need. Um, and so that's probably around, well, the mat is 600. And so the panels can be around the same for four panels. Um, and then you've got the, uh, I guess the tags. That's the, that's the big variable is how many tags you want. If, if you're going to time a race. Well, let's leave, let's leave the tags out of it for now. Just, tags just, out. Okay. just, yeah, just, just the price of the hardware itself. Sure. So the hardware itself without the software is like $2,300 for the four port model. And that's all brand new stuff. And then with the four port, uh, the eight port model, it is, uh, I've got it pulled up here. Let me see. Yeah, 2870. And that and that includes the Ethernet core, which you may already have. It includes a battery backup. I, I think uh, a critical component of your timing system, if you're thinking about building your own, you've got to have a, uh, some kind of battery backup, a UPS battery backup or something. Because if you show up at a race and, uh, you know, these readers are very sensitive to power fluctuations, by the way. So if you plug a reader into a generator, you're just asking for trouble. Uh, you know, that generator could fluctuate or whatever. Let's say you send a print job out and the generator kicks up and your reader's done, down. And so you want to have a UPS battery backup. So that, that price includes, let me see here, it includes the reader. It includes the power supply to the reader. includes a 10-foot Ethernet cord. includes uh, four circular antennas. Uh, includes mounting brackets. So be able to put those antennas onto tripods. It includes the tripods. Um, it includes a two 15 foot Ethernet, I'm oh, sorry, uh, antenna cables, and also two 50 foot Ethernet uh, antenna cables. That way, if you want to go through your arch or under or whatever. And then, yeah, the tripods and then the software is. So, the software included on top of that would be roughly $3,500, $3,600 for everything. Right. So, $3,500, $3,600 for the eight port. That's right? the top of the line. Yeah. Top of the line, eight port, $3,600. And then, roughly like, about eight hundred dollars less, sort of, sort of like you know, 
high 2,000, 2,800 or something for a four port. Yeah, right around 3,000 for the four port, including the software and everything. So you're building your own RFID timing system. You're going to need some timing software. Well, there's a few options on the market for you, some more reliable than others. And there's currently one leading piece of timing software you definitely want to look into, race day scoring. Race day scoring has absolutely everything you'll ever need to time and score your race. It integrates with all popular branded timing systems like ChronoTrack, MyLabs and Race Result, and it can be configured to work with any custom timing system you build. With race day scoring, you get live results that can feed to your registration system, giving you real-time participant text notifications. You get all the different scoring configurations you're ever going to need. You can score age groups, you can score relays, anything you need really. And you even get a manual timing option, so you can manage your backup times in the same system that's doing your main chip timing. And probably one of the best things about race day scoring is the price. Race Day Scoring works on a subscription basis and you pay based on the number of participants you want to time. So if you want to time 10,000 participants, you'll pay $400. And if you're only timing 2,500, you'll only pay $150, which works out to literally only a few cents per participant. And if the races you're timing are hosted on Give Sign Up, Run Sign Up, you get a further massive discount on those prices of between 25 and 80%. So when you do come to consider your timing software purchase, definitely give race day scoring a look you can find more information on the race day scoring suite the pricing and the amazing team behind the software on the race day scoring website racedayscoring.blog that's racedayscoring.blog okay now let's get back to talking rfid timing systems with brian ag next up using your rfid timing system on race day so now, moving on to, um, you know, I've built my system, I've tested it out, right? Just using it practically in a race, right? So first of all, let's um, go over the principle of, I mean, I, I suppose people may not, may not necessarily know this, that, you know, like when we're talking about a, a timing system, we're actually thinking of a single timing point, right? So Wherever you lay down your system, you're going to be recording a time at that point. And I guess if you have like maybe an out and back course or a loop course or something, maybe just a single system at the start finish line, which is essentially the same point, would work fine. But if you have a point to point system, then I guess you either get two systems for your start and finish line or just don't have one at the start line, you know, if you want to be on a budget and just put it at the finish line, or do you even think of moving it during the race? So like, how does that consideration work in terms of me thinking how many timing systems I would need for the type of event I have? Yeah. So of course I've done all, everything you mentioned, I've, I've moved it. I've, I've, uh, of course done the starts and finishes multiple, you know, three or four out on the course and whatever, all that stuff. So the advice I give uh, my customers is if you ask the race director, if they want a chip start, what's their answer going to be 100% of the time? Yes. Right. Of course. Let's say the race has 50 people in it. You ask them, do you want a chip start for 50 people? Well, sure. Right. So number one, you have to understand when is it necessary? When, when, when you yeah, don't even bring it up. Uh, you know, if they ask you specifically and they have a good reason, you know, but let's say that you're hiring me to, to time a race and you say, Hey, can we do a chip start? And I see that you have 50 people every year. I'm going to say, well, look, I, we can do it, but, you know, I kind of explain that um, in a very polite, very respectful way that it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so, and by the way, just to, just to clarify for people uh, listening in, a tip start would be when you would actually, you would actually time people from the time where they actually crossed the start line. Correct. Right. It's interesting that I, I kind of make fun of the 50 person race, but guess what happened last year? Of course, with COVID, we all started separated. And so, yes, with every race we timed last year, no matter what the size was, we offered a window to say, hey, look, you can start anytime. Really, just, you know, basically we said you need to, let's say your race has started at eight. I would say, hey, just, you can start separated if you want to wait, sit in a car, let everyone leave, whatever. Uh, and we just had a time limit to say, okay, you need to start by 830. And, and that way people can start whenever they want to. So, uh, so some of these stories I tell, yeah, you know, I'm thinking back before COVID, but so a 50 person race now truly may need a chip start if they still want to keep things separated or whatever. Right. Because essentially um, they need to start people off uh, distanced, right? 
and still people need to have an accurate time from the point when they cross the start line to the point where they cross the finish line, which if they start, you know, like if, if as a race director for safety reasons, you're starting people off every 20 or 30 seconds, you know, you can't just assume that everyone, you know, went off at 8 a.m. You need to be yeah. giving people the benefit of w- where they crossed the start line and you need a timing system for that to be at the start line to know when people cross that start line. Yeah. So, yeah, obviously, if we we're doing a race where the start and finish are the exact same location, I don't care how many people's in it. If they want to do a chip start, no big deal. Because like like you, yeah, as, as you probably alluded to, it's just a, a flip of a switch basically in the software. Like, okay, I'm doing chip start and now I'm doing finish. Um, and so easy peasy, why not? Uh, but if you're asking me, you know, the starting line is three miles away from the finish line and you've got 50 people and there's no COVID, you know, requirements. And I'm like, well, you know, maybe I'll do it if you want me to, but I may add an extra charge on top of that just because of, uh, you know, whatever. Now, if it's a large race, I would do it without adding any extra cost because guess what? Larger races usually pay a little more. So you get some benefits out of that. Plus it's just expected. If you've got a good example, I guess, is if your race had over 500 people and it's a you know, it doesn't matter the distance, I guess, but then I would say, hey, if you want to chip start, yeah, I'll do that. Uh, but you're right. You would have to have two separate systems. Now, there's been some races where the starting line and finish line aren't the same, but they're close enough to where I've been able to carry the equipment. And so let's let's imagine this and think through what you would need. You know, you need to bring your laptop. You need to bring a battery backup. Again, that's, and that's really all you have to bring, a, a inexpensive battery backup. A lot of people don't know this. The reader uses very, very little power. And so inexpensive battery backup, um, and I don't have the numbers, but it's like 625 volt battery backup, whatever you can buy them at Walmart or Best Buy or whatever for like 50, 60 bucks. And then by the way, some people come up with some really fancy, crazy, you know, really neat battery stuff that, uh, I'm not an electrical guy. Um, but with the DIY system, whatever is reliable for your reader, but an inexpensive battery backup will keep a reader powered on for about three hours, nonstop reading. Okay. And so usually when I'm doing a chip start, that's, you know, maybe close enough, I can just carry the equipment over. I'll bring my laptop reader battery backup. And then whatever antennas and cables I need to, to do the job. And that's something I can easily, you know, put into a tote after it's done, carry it back over the finish line, unload it and whatever. Obviously, you get the the, uh, the consideration of what if it's a, a 5K and, uh, you know, you got a little rush there because you only have 15, 16, 17 minutes from the moment they start to the moment they finish. So, you know, if it's a super, super short race, it's kind of a risk to be carrying equipment around. But yeah, uh, it's doable. Yeah. You need to know your stuff though. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, it, it's probably sort of uh, not an entry level thing to have a 5k and to be thinking that you'll be able to manage putting a race, uh, p- putting your timing system at the start line and then having to move it and set it up and, you know, be confident that it works before the the first uh, runner crosses the finish line. It's a little bit, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's a, you need still nerves of steel for that, for sure. Yeah, and I'm sure I don't know if we plan on talking about backup systems, but you know, you're you're most races. If you've been around races, you know that the the first ten percent of runners are those studs, female or male studs that are like out there by themselves. And so, if you've got some kind of backup system, even if you're a minute or two late, I mean, hopefully, God forbid you are, but yeah, you know, hopefully you catch the bulk of the people, and you only have to do a couple of manu- manual entries. But yeah, carrying the equipment, I've only done it a couple of times over the years, but it's it's possible. Right. So then, just to wrap up the whole kind of, you know, how many systems do I need for my race? You should think, you know, goes without saying you need one at the finish line. Now, you know, if your course start line and finish line are at the same point, fantastic, because then you get two reads and, you know, like however uh, long apart and you assume first one is the start, second one is the finish kind of thing. Then if you, if your course is more of a point to point and you really, really want to have, as you said, like a chip time, meaning from the point where the person crossed the start line, which would make sense if you have lots of runners, right? That won't cross within a second or two, as in a 50-person race in the old days, right? Pre-COVID, then you would need two systems, at least start and finish. And then anything in between, I guess, you know, you have a long race, you have the ambitions, let's say, in your marathon to be giving split times at 10K, 20K, whatever, you need to have a system there. Yeah, and most of the marathons we time, it's it's not about providing the split times. It's just providing evidence that this person completed the whole course, right? And so obviously it's a nice benefit for the runner to be able to say, oh, here was your 10K split, here is your whatever. But you know, a lot of marathons, they do it for, for the two benefits of here's your splits and you didn't cheat. Mm-hmm. Okay, so 
now that we've clarified that, let's move on to one very important um, aspect of all this, particularly for people who are just starting out races with systems like these. What do I need to consider to make sure that I get as high of a read rate with my system as possible? What do I need to do with my tags? What do I tell my runners? How do I set up my system at the finish line? And I appreciate there's going to be tons of tips here, but like, what are the key basic things that I need to think about to make sure that my system works optimally and I'm capturing as many reads um, as I can? Sure. And I guess I'll echo back to something you said earlier about when you first get a system and you you go to test it out. Well, so what I tell people about this is that because, you know, everyone has their own idea of what they want to do. And I can tell people, hey, you're absolute 100 percent reliable ways to do this. But they may say, well, I want to do this because this is what's popular in my area. Right. So the first thing you should do is when you get a system in and I kind of joke about it, but it's, it's the reality. Uh, and I don't mean physically break it, but you want to see. Uh, I say, I say it's worth the price of pizza to invite a bunch of your friends over, or if you're a coach buying a system, uh, you know, get, a, get, bring it to the track and say, all right, fellas, uh, or ladies or whatever, we're going to try to break the system. So try, if you want to try bib tags, all right, slap a bib on the, on the chest and then try to say, all right, yeah, everybody sprint through as fast as you can. Did we miss anybody? All right. Well, now let me, let me turn my antennas this way, or let me do that. Right. Let me shift things around. So I, I, every time, or I mean, it would be pretty irresponsible for your first time to test that and hope it works was at a race, right? So first thing you should do is whatever setup you want to go with, get some pizza, invite a bunch of people over and try to break it, right? So figure out what works and what doesn't work. What you'll find, it was a UHF RFID. You can flick a tag in front of the antenna as fast as you want and it's going to pick it up every time. Mm-hmm. But you can also take a wet paper towel or a piece of aluminum foil or your pinky finger and cover the tag and it can't see it. So it's like you have to understand like, okay, there's some there's some things you got to know about. And so... um, yeah, my advice for, pe- for people and what I found is when I first built a system, I assumed that these other systems that were uh, slapping tags on the back of the bib that, OK, I'm going to piggyback off their research. There's nothing, you know, I, nothing says I can't throw a tag on the back of the bib. So I'm going to try that. And I would set antennas up in different places. And what I would find is that I would most of the time get picked up. No problems. But every now and then I'd run through and it miss me. And I'm like, what, wait a minute. How can I flick a tag as fast as I want? And it get me every time. But what if I, if I stack the, stick the tag on my bib, it would miss me every now and then. Very rare, but every now and then. Well, what you learn is that tags are very sensitive to water. And so when you sweat, where do, what, what's the wettest part of your body, right? And so what's uh, also the thickest part of your body? And so what I quickly discovered was that a lot of these systems that are pushing bib tags, and they offer no other solution, by the way. They offer just bib, not, not all, but some offer just bib tags. Um, and that's, they've told me, by the way, it's like, that's our cash cow. Like, you know, that's how we, this is the base of staying in business. And so if you're going to use bib tags, test it like crazy, try overhead, try side mounted, try, and you know, uh, different things. And, and you got to test those stuff anyways, because, you know, if you've got a mat antenna, it may require based on the mat you have tags are horizontal on the back of the bib or vertical on the back of the bib. And so, but my recommendation is, and I, I never intended to make my own tags. I'm, I'm not trying to pitch this, but I'll tell you what I do. Uh, because I didn't patent this design on purpose. I tell my customers, there's plenty of them that make their own tags. What I found was when the tag is placed on the drier part of the body and the skinnier part of the body. So for me, it's like having pin it to the side of the shorts or have it slide it down the shoelace. Um, then it gets picked up every time reliably. Uh, obviously, you could have some situation where you know someone takes a shoe off, stick it in the ta- you know, tag in there and put the shoe back on. I've, I've actually seen that. Or you've got some girls with like yoga pants that have a little side pocket that's real tight, you know, and they can stick their tag in there. Well, that presses it hard up against the skin. So that's, you know, it could be a problem. But what I found is that when the tag is on the on the skinnier part of the body and the drier part of the body, it comes across directly facing the side panel antennas. You just can't miss them. Um, so that's kind of my recommendation, but, but I'm only going to recommend what's going to give me, you know, again, what's going to make me look good, the software and least tech support. So... Yeah, some people thought about using like slap on wristbands, you know, back in the old days, the, the, the slap bracelets or whatever. Uh, I wouldn't do any kind of wristbands. I haven't found that those would work well. Because imagine you got people crossing the line with their hands up in the air, you know, cheering or whatever. And they could, you know, they're pushing that antenna way away from the mad antenna or way above the reach maybe of the uh, side panels. So you want to put the tag in a position that it's going to come across pretty consistent every time. And so typically that's going to be the, the bibs, the shoes, or the side of the shorts. Hmm. So I've seen actually uh, some people online because we have, and and it's going to be in the notes, we have a group on Facebook, very popular group, just for people who are interested in race timing. It's called Race Mm -hmm. Timing Hub and you're there and people, you know, quite quite a lot of people who actually start on that journey to building their system and testing and scaling systems like this go there and they discuss things. 
And one of the things that uh, sometimes comes up is the suggestion that people might use two tags, for instance. So, you know, like instead of instead of sending out runners with one tag, you give them two tags, sort of like the equivalent of the double mask, I guess, now that we're in sort of like COVID, COVID times and yeah, people yeah, understand yeah. that. Does that make sense to you, doing the, the double tag thing? Does it improve things? Oh, man, I'm glad you asked because I wouldn't brought that up. That's a good question. The um, I prefer double tagging. A uh, t- couple reasons. Number one, again, the tags that I design, and I'll tell you how to make them. They're simply laminated RFID inlays. That's all it is. I simply laminate it. And now, and now guess what? They're reusable. They're all weather. Uh, and because they're reusable, it doesn't cost me any more to double tag you versus single tag if I had the tags, right? And so uh, when you put a single tag on a person, you know, let's say it's a, a cross country race and you've got a bunch of kids doing it. Kids are kids. They're going to, who knows what they're going to do with those tags, right? And so what I like to do is I like to double tag that way. I'm twice as likely to be able to sit back and just enjoy the race, right? If I double tag you and, and, and let's imagine that scenario earlier where there's a tight group coming through and I've got, let's say antennas on both sides, maybe even a mad antenna down below. Uh, if I double tag you and four people come across at the same time, then it's highly unlikely that at least one of your tags is not going to get picked up by at least one of the antennas. And so it's really rare for us. And again, we time 70 plus races a year and there's over 500 uh, race timing companies using my software. And so I, I hear a lot of feedback on what works or what doesn't work. Um, yeah, I said that timing race timing hub is a great resource. I've got a user's form. That's a great resource. And and you'll hear on there like, hey, you know, I found that this doesn't work. Don't do this or whatever. Um, but yeah, double tagging is kind of what I recommend. You know, the single tag, it's going to save a little money, I guess, if, if you just buy just what you need. But most people buy more than they need. But yeah, just just imagine it doubles your chances for 100%. And that's what everyone wants is 100% read rates consistently. And with a double tag, would the recommendation be that you place each of the two tags at a different part of the body or something? Or is it more for redundancy, both of them at the same place? So I'm kind of indifferent on where you place it. The only rule that you got to follow with this uh, is that you can't place two tags. Let's say that I gave you a, because the way I do my bibs is I'll, I'll, I'll take two tags, you know, laminated tags, and I'll, I'll take one safety pin and I'll attach it to the, ta- to the bib. So now you've got a bib when you show up at my race that's got two tags hanging off of it. And so the problem is that if a person thinks, oh, I'll just take this one safety pin and leave both tags hanging off of it and I'll, t- I'll pin it to myself. Well, now you've got two tags that are sandwiched together. Okay. They're, they're basically touching each other or, or they're really, really close. That's the one thing where I've seen where there's misses is two tags sandwiched on top of each other can kind of cancel each other out. So really, I don't really care how you place them, but they need to be separated by a couple inches. And yes, ideally, I would place one on each side of their body so that, you know, again, I, I can read one of your tags from one of, one of your sides of your body should get picked up. Mm-hmm. And uh, since we're on to tags now, and earlier when I asked you about the cost of building a system, we only focused on the hardware. Can you give us an idea of what buying, you know, like a bunch of tags for an open system like this uh, generally costs? So yeah, it's been a while since I've looked at dog bone tags. Uh, I know that you used to be able to buy those for less than 25 cents a piece, maybe even less mm-hmm. than 20 in some places. And so that's that's why they're pretty popular, pretty inexpensive. Just throw them in the back of the bib. And, you know, of course, you got to program the tag or, or have a cross-reference file based on the system you're using. But, yeah, yeah dog bones that on the back of the bib are typically 15 to 20 cents a piece. Uh, the ones that we use for the laminated tags, uh, we buy those like at, at 10 cents a piece. But, of course, we're buying those at, you know, 15,000 at a time or whatever. Um, and so... That's kind of the cost you're looking at. Now, the lam- let's say you went through the whole process of laminating them, you know, making the tags reusable, uh, which, again, that's what I do because I don't want to have to always be worrying about inventory of tags. With as many races as we time, I don't want to have to be constantly thinking about, okay, do I have enough for next weekend or whatever? And I'm constantly buying more and all that stuff. And plus, with the chip shortage, it's even hard to find tags now. So that's it's even more of an, an attraction to use reusable tags. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of the price you're looking at is 10 cents roughly if you buy in bulk. If you don't buy in bulk, you're still going to pay 15 to 20 cents, even for the, the short squiggles, what we use for the, the hip tags or shoe tags. Mm-hmm. So the, the one rule too, by the way, is if you're going to use bib tags, there's only one tag you should use. Now, I know that there's a couple of companies that uh, I know race results have has come up with their own design. And I think it's a cool that I trust their work. They, they're really good at what they do. Uh, and so they have a good bib tag. But in general, for an open source tag, you're going to want to use the dog bone tag only for the back of the bib. You could use different tags, but you're going to have to multiple tag the back of the bib. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the dog bone you mentioned there is a is a super popular tag. Uh, whoever just gets into this uh, world, they'll come across this very, very soon. Uh, super popular mm-hmm. tag. 
Um, so one last thing on tags, just to uh, give people an idea on that as well. I get my tags in. How do I actually program them to match my participant list? And like, how does that whole thing of the encoding of the tags and the tag telling the reader who the runner crosses the line is, how does that whole thing work? Sure. So if you're, let's say that you're listening to this and you're a developer and you plan on developing your own system, you got two considerations. Um, if you're not a developer, you just have the, you just have to do whatever the software company tells you, you know, it, it expects. So if you are a software developer, uh, you have to decide, okay, do I have a cross-reference file where I've, I take these tags and they come with a default EPC that's unique to, to you know, should be unique across all tags. Uh, and you can say, okay, well, this unique EP, EPC ties to this bib number or this athlete. Uh, and then this other one, if you know, double tag, you say, okay, this di- other EPC ties this athlete. So you'd have to have some kind of cross-reference table in your database or whatever. We'll get off of that because there's probably not many people listening to this are going to do all, all that. But so you, it depends on what your system is, is expecting. And so I know there's some systems out there expect a cross-reference file. Other systems like mine, what you do is you actually program your tags before race day. Now, I do it during the slow winter months or slow summer months. I'll take I'll order a stack of, let's say, 10,000 bibs or more, and I will blindly grab two tags out of my re- tag return bin you know, from the previous races grab two tags, attach them to bibs. And that's my first process is just take two tags, attach them to bibs, right? I don't care what they're programmed to. I just, I, I get my bibs ready. And then once I get all my bibs with tags on them, then I go through the bibs again. I drop them on top of an antenna and I've got my antenna facing straight up. So it's kind of like a little table. So I just drop it on there and I'll say, all right, you're going to be bib number one, for example. And I just hit the enter key twice because there's a little screen where you can type in the bib number, you know, and then when I hit it twice, it programs both tags to one. And it also auto increments to the next number. So I can say, all right, well, now it goes to two. So I'll grab two, slap it on, enter key, enter key, grab three, enter key, enter key. It's a, it's a pretty quick process. So that that's the 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 two trains of thought is that your EPC, which is the data that the tag is returning, is going to return the bib number. And the benefit with that is that I can program and prepare tens of thousands of bibs before I get hired to even time my first race. Mm-hmm. And so let's say that Panos uh, calls me up, says, oh, man, in two days, I've got my race and my race timer just backed out. I've got 3,000 people. Can you come do it? I just grab, a st- you know, it doesn't matter, a stack of bibs, and I show up in time your race. And so when I pull people in either from, you know, some online registration platform or whatever, you know, I tell my software, okay, start with bib number X that I'm going to use and go up from there. And, uh, of course, the day before the race or the morning of, I, I pass out the bib numbers when people show up. So I hope that, I hope that paints a clear picture on, on the options. Sure. Last thing I want to talk about is backups. So you mentioned that earlier a little bit. It's a super important topic because let's remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about building something that records finish times. There's nothing more precious to Mm -hmm. a participant in a race than having a finish time and nothing that can harm your race more than getting people through the finish line that, that have paid, you know, decent money to take part in it without recording a finish time. That's going to that's gonna hurt your race's reputation quite a lot. Systems, whatever system, you know, whether it's a timing system or a rocket taking you to the moon fail sometimes. So what would be your best choices of backup for a system like the one we're discussing here? Yeah, you're right. That's extremely important. And it, it, uh, when I hear that people are 100% relied on their reading, reader and they don't have any backup system, it just melts me inside, right? And so you got to have a backup system. And I've been at races, by the way, where they didn't. It's just, I mean, one hometown over from that, is, I was at this race and they had some problem during the race. Before the race was over, they packed up and left. No results. They just packed up and left. I guess they knew their goose was cooked and they just left. And it was like, oh my gosh. And so, yeah, you have to have a backup system. Can you imagine... I mean, it would, you would just turn into a ghost if you relied on your reader only or your laptop only and it just shut down and you were just totally, you know, messed up. So, yeah. So here's what I recommend. Minimum backups. Um, number one, I think everybody should. And most people don't, but I think they should because they're so inexpensive. Buy an inexpensive camcorder. Mm-hmm. I mean, good grief. Just buy a camcorder. Throw it on a tripod. It's not connected to anything. You can buy camcorders really cheap online. You just have to remember. And this is the hardest part. The hardest part is remembering to hit record and turning it on, you know, hit record before the first finisher comes in. Usually the first finisher goes by and I'm like, oh, wait, I got to turn my camera on. So anyways, buy a king quarter, uh, set it up, record the whole finish line. That That's kind of your ultimate worst case scenario backup. But the, it's more than a backup, you know, with a, 
uh, run sign up and I know race entry does this and probably other platforms. Uh, of course, YouTube is free when the race is over, upload it to YouTube free to do. Uh, if you've got a results platform that, that handles linking the results to a YouTube video, then you as a timer, not only do you have a good backup, a decent backup system, that's a worst case scenario, but you look great, right? You can provide results that have a video, you know, like jump straight to their finish. Hey, you're going to get hired again, right? Um, so buy a camcorder. So we've got the camcorder. Yeah, that's something I feel like everybody should have. My manual timing system backup is a second laptop. And I let that laptop be run by volunteers um, because, you know, God forbid I have to rely on it completely. Let's say that worst case scenario, hopefully the worst case scenario is that Windows 10 doesn't update and, you know, restarts my chip timing computer in the middle of the race. You know, assuming it's back up in a couple minutes, I'm not going to totally throw that system away. I'm going to get it back up, get the system going. And I've only got two minutes to fill the gap, right? And so you have to have some backup system. Um, and so what I do is I set up another laptop. Uh, it's got a copy of the race. It's got everything there. And I have someone that's simply pressing the space bar or there's a little USB plunger they can use. Um, and, and all that's doing is capturing your time for every finisher. It doesn't matter what race they're in. If someone crossed that line, you hit the button. That's it. And then at the end of the finish on shoot, I have someone writing bib numbers in order. And so if it's a large race, you know, I don't want that person looking up and looking down, looking up. I have someone standing next to them calling numbers out, you know, 32, 18, 104, whatever. And so uh, between those two systems, I can always fill any holes or fill any gaps or figure out, okay, hey, what was that number or whatever. And at a worst case scenario, I could do results with that if I, if I absolutely had to. Uh, but that's, that's assuming like some catastrophic failure. Um, but yeah, so it, We've we've had times, of course, where I've had to refer to that, like, hey, there's a couple of pe couple of people here. What happened or whatever? Maybe they didn't wear the tags, or whatever. But yeah, that's what I do for a backup system. I've tried setting up, like, say, for some of our biggest races, a totally separate system, either right before the finish line or right after. And what I've found so far is that if you set it up before, when are people going to want to quit the race? A little early. They're going to cross that mat, the first mat, and think they're done. All right. And so, if you set it up after, uh, I don't know. It's just it hasn't. I haven't seen any benefit with setting up a whole separate system. Uh, I've been able to do everything I need with just a manual backup system. Yeah. And I guess even though the probability of both timing systems failing is fairly remote, when you have two timing systems, particularly two timing systems that rely on the same tag, they may both fail. So I guess with a proper backup, it's, it's probably wise to go with a kind of backup that is completely independent almost of your of your main system right yeah the, the only common variable here is is the software of course right and now some people say well maybe i should use this other software or this other system like you know those old printing stopwatches you know if you remember those back in the day uh and that's where i think okay we may be going too far separate right because um you know doing results with something totally separate where you don't have any of the participants information in there that's uh that would be really rough and so i think that yeah, having two totally separate systems, one manual, one chip, uh, is is good. And I think that they both should be that, you know, if you're using a different software or whatever, both the same software, because then it's maybe really easy to sync the data back and forth. You can easily say, okay, yeah, you know, maybe you had 25 people register that day. Uh, well, on the other laptop, I just hit one button, boom, sync, and they're all in there. If they're if they're using Run Sign Up or Race Entry or Race Ross or whatever. Worst case, they're not using any of those, and I'll just copy a database over or whatever. But yeah, so you want to have... Uh, a, a manual system and then a chip system. And then on top of that, the camcorder. And on top of that, uh, I don't know if other systems do this. Uh, yeah, my system will automatically take a picture of every finisher and stuff like that. So I've got photos, I got video, I've got a manual and I've got a chip timing. Right. Uh, backup. Yeah. Right. Okay, great. I think, I think we've covered uh, most of the, of the ground that um, I wanted us to cover in terms of putting the system together, using it, operating it, backups, all of that stuff. You've done this thing and your customers have done this thing, um, you know, thousands of times. Any last kind of words of wisdom for people who are looking to jump into this world of building their own system and doing their own timing? Well, I think you brought up a good resource earlier, the Race Timing Hub. Uh, there's, a, of course, Timers Talk, which is, that can be hit or miss because I think there's a lot of very vocal people that are like salesmen for their other systems. But the Race Timing Hub seems to be more, uh, I don't know, it's 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 a a kinder, uh, crowd that, uh, more likely to help. I think, um, not, not more likely to try to say something the way I look at it. I'm just a software guy. So if you say, Hey, have you thought about using this or what about, have you tried that? I've probably tried it and I can tell you, Hey, here's my experience or I wouldn't recommend this hardware or whatever. So yeah, glean from the, uh, the wisdom of people that have, have been down the road. 
but yeah, that I guess that's the number one advice. Indeed. And that's actually what I also tell uh, race directors starting out in this. You know, we have like uh, extensive content on how to do a million things. And the number one thing that's uh, at the top of all of that is get talking to someone who's done this before and sort of like learn from them. I think it's the most invaluable resource you can have in this in this business. So you mentioned, and I know you are very uh, kindly offering advice to people online on all kinds of things. Where can people find you? Where can they find AG Race Timing? Websites, emails, tell us all about it. Yeah, so I guess, you know, stop number one would be the website, you know, agracetiming.com. Uh, it's got... So you'll see on there that uh, if you're looking for hardware and what all is required and whatever else, there's uh, my website's kind of divided into two sections. You want the left section, which is Tommy Systems. If you click in there, there's a, a couple of packages I, I put together. Those pa- we don't have a box that says here's this package. What we do is we say, look, if you're wanting to build your own system, here's everything that's needed. So there you can see a list, and you can also see how much each of those items would be from us. Uh, so if you can find one of the components is cheaper. Or if you have a question about, well, you know, I found this antenna on eBay. Will this work? Send it to me. I'll say, yeah, you're nay. You know, so that, that's one resource. Uh, number two, of course, uh, my, my email is on the website and all that stuff. One thing is, I guess I'll say is that I think, I don't know how many other systems do this, but I've got a 100% open uh, users form. Now, if, it, if you're going to post on there, you have to actually join or request to join because I don't want people trying to sell life insurance or whatever on there. But, um, you know, you can jump on the users forum. And the forum is great because, again, it's years and years of, of people saying, hey, Here's what's worked. I did this type of race. And so if you're trying to time some kind of race that's unique, you'll find all kinds of great pictures and videos and tips and stuff from other users that have done what you're trying to do uh, or tried hardware that you're considering trying. Um, and you'll find some stories on there that are like, hey, I'm having bad results and I finally figured out what it was. Little tips. I'll give you one little nugget just for fun, right? So let's say you laminate a tag and you decide, you know what would be cool if I, if I place a paper label over it to, to show my company name or logo on it. Well, if you're timing cross country races, running through dew, what's going to happen? To that paper label It's going to get a little wet. You're going to have bad read rates, and so really great wisdom out there. You can learn from other people's mistakes and other people's successes. Yeah, that, that's I guess the two main resources: my website and the users group, and then the race timing hub, and people like you out there putting good information out there. Perfect. And um, you also work with I think your hardware. You work with um, Atlas RFID store, right? Yeah. So yeah, Atlas and I have a great relationship. A lot of products that we supply, if you were to buy a package system us, some of that stuff comes from Atlas. And so uh, I've really enjoyed working with them over the years. They're, they can be trusted um, to provide good tags and everything else. So yeah, they're a good company. Yeah, so do we. And we have uh, we have an offer from Atlas RFID store. Really great guys. They know their stuff. They know race timing. And uh, you could uh, get a listen of that at the end of the episode. So, Brian, thank you very, very much for your time and sharing all these uh, great tips with us today. People know where to find you. I'm hoping to be able to speak to you soon. Thank you very much again for your time and thanks to everyone listening in. And we'll see everyone on the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this episode on building an RFID timing system with AG Race Timing owner Brian AG. You can find more resources on anything and everything related to race directing on our website, racedirectorshq.com, where you'll also find a 5% discount from Atlas RFID store for all your RFID timing equipment needs and a 15% discount from Brian on his full-featured timing software that you can use with both your DIY and proprietary timing system. If you are building and operating your own system, Race Timing Hub is our Facebook group dedicated just to race timing and building race timing systems. So come join that and people, including Brian, will be glad to help you out with any questions you may have. If you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe or leave a review on your favorite player. And also check out the podcast back catalog for more great content like this. Until our next episode, take care and keep putting on amazing races.